This week in disc golf, we saw a breakout performance by some relative unknowns. Kyle Klein cruises to his first major victory, a controversial call on 18 that not only shaped the FPO final, but has the entire community buzzing, and so much more. Welcome, Disc Generates. It's Swiss with the Disc Golf World, and you guys already know the one with all the holes in his game. The only ones on tour with all your favorite pros while living out of a minivan. We are the hardest working disc golf channel in the game. Still out here providing the humor takes on all things disc golf from the previous week. You are watching this week in Disc Disc golf. Shout out to all of you who have subscribed and everyone who came up to us this past weekend. It does mean a lot to us. And as the season rolls to its finish, trust that the disc golf world will continue to pump out all the disc golf content and news of all the off-season action. Big major weekend at the USDGC, well at least for the men. Dumb, but either way, let's get into all the action. Day one of the USDGC saw some of the biggest names on tour start off slowly on the historic track. Defending champ Gannon Burr opened up with a 1-under 53rd place, while Ricky Wysocki, Eagle McMahon, Simon Lazat, and Isaac Robinson weren't much better, as each of them found themselves in 15th place or lower. Only Anthony Barella, Calvin Heinberg, and Chris Dickerson, each with 6-unders, were able to finish the day in 10th place. And the struggles for all these players would continue throughout the weekend, as only two would find themselves atop the podium, and only one other in the top five. The only name remaining and the only one to hold an Elite Series victory who found themselves on lead card was Kyle Klein, who still looks like he could be walking the halls of William McKinley, singing Don't Stop Believing" with his other Glee teammates. Kyle, despite having a double bogey and two more bogeys, was still able to finish with a 9-under round, mainly due to him having a 10-under through a 9-hole stretch. Cole Rodallin with the no-chains ace on day one on the island hole of 17. Cole would struggle on the weekend, finishing a disappointing 73rd place. Many were introduced to Sullivan, call him Sully Tipton, who has one of the premier forehands on tour. The young player finished the day tied for second and made his first lead card ever at arguably the biggest major of the year, only to have an ace himself on the famous gate hole of seven the very next day for what was a dream weekend for this young player. Sully had never finished above 21st place at any elite series this year and outside top 30 of every major he competed in. Yet he was able to make a lead card all three days and despite a poor final day, still finished in 12th place for his best finish at a major of his young career. Round one also saw one of the best back nines over the entire weekend come from Joel Freeman. His highlight play shined brighter than his high visibility construction fit choices as he put together an eight down on the back half. Joel would eagle hole 10 and birdie his way to hole 18 where he would eventually bogey the final hole, finishing the day with the hot round 10 under. And though many are vocally critical of Joel Freeman's self-deprecating displays that look like an angrier version of a wacky, waving, inflatable arm flailing tube man, Joel showed those rooting against him that he wasn't going anywhere after a 9-under the very next day, which kept him atop the leaderboard with a one-stroke lead over Kyle Klein heading into moving day. Klein, who also matched Joel's 9-under, was in control for much of the round also until hole 12, where after going OB, chose to lay up instead of pushing to a deeper landing zone, guaranteeing a double bogey. Yet for this young player to take his medicine instead of trying to keep pace with a surging Joel showed his disc golf acumen of not only knowing and believing in his skills, but also how the course will play over the remaining days. They too also saw the hot round of the tournament with Chris Clements with a head and shoulders clean bogey free 11 under round. Chris unfortunately would follow that up with his worst round over the weekend, a one under on moving day, but was able to climb back to a top 10 finish for the tournament's end. Day two also saw Bradley Williams, who gets excited for Christmas only for the fruitcakes, leapfrogged his way into the lead heading into moving day with a 10 under round. And for anyone paying attention, it should come to no surprise Bradley, a position disc golfer, would excel on this track. Moving day would end up being an absolute bore as gusty conditions made scoring difficult. The day only saw three players score lower than five under as big name players Ricky, Calvin, and Isaac moved up the leaderboard. Ricky's 10 under in those conditions might have been one of the best rounds of the entire weekend. It would not only get him into the top 10, but saved his tournament by jumping him up 43 spots from the previous day's 52nd place. Yet is mostly forgotten due to him only going 8 under collectively over the other 3 days, which resulted in him in never really putting himself in podium contention talks. Vinny 7 under only jumped him 24 spots and into the top 10. Vinny would have a strong back 9 where after a bogey 10 he would birdie 6 of the remaining 8 holes. For those expecting the eventual Joel blow-up, moving day would not disappoint. When after going two over on the front, Joel looked to regain control of the round with an eagle on 10 and birdieing two of the next three holes, only for him to triple bogey 14 where he went into the hazard only to crumble on the putting green after an unfortunate roll away, then to follow up the very next hole missing a par on a 15-footer. The two-over round put him five strokes off the lead heading into the final day. 
and Klein's four under was enough for him to be atop that leaderboard and control of this major heading into the final day with a three-stroke lead over Bradley Williams. If there was any doubt that Klein would not walk away with this victory and a complete redemption for his playoff loss here to the GOAT Macbeth in 2021, he'd put it to rest quickly as he only went six under on the front nine on the final day. In comparison, the rest of the league card would collectively shoot even on the front. And with the remaining fields and big names in the game too far away to push for anything but possible podium finishes, Klein with the hot start was only looking at a back nine victory parade. And after an eagle on 10 and birdie 11, Klein would play the remainder of the course for par and cruise to victory. Anytime that you can triple bogey the final hole and still be in no danger of losing, that's an absolute dominating performance. Bradley would finish with a second place finish, and though he hinted he would leave his second place trophy yet again at an Airbnb, I think this one might be a little bit different though. But respect the call out if he did or didn't. And after a hot round 10 under on the final day, this year's two-time major winner Isaac Robinson added a top three finish at this major, tying Simon Lazat for third place at 23 under for the tournament. Classic Vinny fashion, he finishes with a hot final round for yet another top five finish where he ended up tying Joel Freeman. Despite Throw Pink not being a major, there was still enough buzz and drama surrounding the ladies' game this weekend that even surpassed some of the action on the MPO. 16-year-old Eliezer Midling owned most of the day one talk. This year's World's NUSDGC distance competition winner showed she has more game than just her power off the tee. She was able to put together a 6-under round, score the only FPO eagle on the difficult 18, and make her first lead card ever, a mere two years into playing the game. She already has some of the best form on tour and also has a smooth putting stroke, something that's missing in the FPO game. If she can stick to it and learn these courses and landing zones, she could have one of the brightest futures in disc golf. Her play was so electric, Evelina Solonen's 11 under and new course record was pushed to the side faster than Prodigy's demotion of KJ being the face of the brand. Evelina actually put together a solid putting performance on her way to one of the highest rated rounds on the season. Good putting performances in Evelina are not said too often, but the 75 5% from C1X was one of her best of the season. And with James Proctor on the bag, surely seemed to keep Evelina in the right mind space for the entire round, as she is able to avoid the blow up rounds that we have far too often seen from her in the past. Hannah Blumroos, card mate, BFF, and fellow lover of the sisterhood of traveling pants, was right behind her with a 10 under round where she was actually better on the putting green. Kristen Tatar, with a respectable 8 under, finished out the lead card after day one. Even though she was three strokes behind on day one, many expected her to carry on to victory, especially with the additional round where consistency often shows through. Day two saw the finished friendship show up to lead card twinning and matching pink, but was still not as weird as seeing Tatar only shoot a one under and fall off the lead card. Ella Hansen's 10 under round moved her into third place three strokes off the lead, one of her best rounds of the season. And her best bud, Holland Hanley's six under was enough to push her onto the lead card also. And even though DGPT's sad efforts of the battle of the friends for day three, most of the coverage returned to Tatar's 10 under round which not only put her atop the leaderboard, but made the race tight enough that all five of these ladies would be in close contention for the win on the final day. Holland from Chase Card put the pressure on early, going six under on the front nine, which would lend to a three-way tie with the others, only strokes off going into the back. Ella and Evelina saw too many bogeys on the back, while Henna scored too many pars to be in contention for the win. Holland, who played clean, made 17's island, sat on the back up on 18, and had a front row seat to watch Sitar play the hole. Tatar, who played blemish-free on the back nine and a hole behind, but chose the layup for the birdie look and allowed Holland to play 18 for par for her biggest win of her career. Then came the drive that would not only tarnish the victory, but become the talk of the tournament, erasing all the great FPO action. Hanley's drive carried over the water, clipped a tree, and did not cross inbounds, which should have forced a re -tee. And with DGBT replaying only confirming those thoughts, what came next upset many. The spotter and ladies never had a great look at the landing zone. It was admitted that there was little discussion on the tee if it crossed prior to walking to the spot. And once there, it was a matter of marking where they thought it crossed. And from there, many want to place the blame on multiple parties while others defend the actions of the card. So let's cover all of them. First, where is the PDGA official or TD? And look, this sport needs officiating to legitimize this sport from being more than a hobby. But at this time, it's not their responsibility. The athletes are asked to self-officiate the rules. And yes, does that sound silly for majors or with this large of purses? Absolutely. But that's where we're at at this time in the sport. So no blame can be placed here. As much as how silly that sounds. Why didn't the card do their job? Keep in mind, not only does someone need to speak up on a ruling or violation, but it also needs confirmation by another player. So we're honestly expecting a volunteer spotter not in a great position, nor playing in the tournament, 
and players to reasonably dictate the spot or read T when the disc was hundreds of feet away. And who knows what those other players' angles were, as the T was on a dock that only a single player could stand on, and the card mates were pushed off to the side. As definitively as that replay looked, do we sincerely believe for someone to speak up and say that that didn't cross, not knowing if it would be second by another player? Who in their right mind would do that at that time, with all that on the line? And if you are that person, I hope to never be on a card with you. And for the few that believe Holland cheated and should have called for the re tee yourself, how many people watch poor shots after they throw them and don't just walk off? Let alone the entire card is asked to officiate. So there comes a point where Holland needs to allow the card to dictate the rules and remove herself from the situation, which she did when they did get to the spot asking for their input. And sincerely, I think it's crazy to accuse Holland of cheating. It's even more insane to accuse the entire card, one who's 16, mind you, I'm purposely not calling it out to allow someone other than Tatar to win. Either way, there's one single solution, and that is to get some form of officiating involved, which might need to be spearheaded by the DGPT, as the PDJ will only spin their wheels on this with their heads too far up their ass. Now, those defending the card, you aren't in the clear here either. No one can debate that more conversation and discussion should have been made. And this benefit goes to the player comments. Many, including host of the coverage, were saying doesn't help defuse this situation either. And if you take that statement to an extreme, why would any rule violation ever be called, including foot faults on hole 16? But guys, let's hear all your thoughts. Anyways, after another Holland OB throw later on the same hole and the Tatar birdie on 18 kind of makes the whole re debate null and void. It's just as likely to say Holland would have pimped that throw, likely that Holland would have performed worse on the re or not. And either way, it resulted in a playoff. The first hole had a brutal roll away for Tar, but both would par the hole. We then moved to the Island 17, where in Emporia, Holland missed the Island in her last playoff of this season. This time, she was able to land it, and it stuck. And after Tatar miss, it sealed Holland's win for the tournament, making for an awkward award celebration as her shirt matched too perfectly with the trophy. More players covered, and the heart-pounding action that only live can provide, all from the comfort of your home, only on the Disc Golf Network. Now, let's get into some of our quick hitters. It's great to see Climo in the booth, and he did a far better job than expected. And if you ask me, a Climo Philo Earhart for every USDGC would make for the best commentary all season. But I certainly didn't expect hearing stories of him out here freestyling frisbees with Brian. But it certainly makes him the champ for life. The only way to improve that story would be if he was shirtless. Speaking of the champ, how about those sad DGBT pre-order shirts? I couldn't wear that shirt to bed without my wife making fun of my ass. Cat Merch does her best Top Chef impression, feeding Nico. Dinner and paper plates is a van flex that too few of people understand. Dave Felberg and Germ had medical issues during the event where one actually returned and the other had to DNF. Isaac Robinson feels Nevin is more difficult than Northwood's black, which maybe we should be really asking Ezra, as he shot Northwood's better than Isaac at Ledgestone. Ella fulfills her bet obligations by dyeing her hair after the Holland win, which looks like some Easter shade that I can't even describe the color. With that second place, Tatar now holds the single highest money earnings in a season, surpassing Ricky's last year's numbers. And keep in mind, there's still a championship still remaining. Speaking of Ricky, he made a top 10 list that everybody's chatting about. So much discussion, it forced us to make our own top 10 list. Make sure to check out Disc Golf World's top 10 below. In some other news, big announcement for disc golf, or at least for what many would consider big news, CBS will feature the World Championship, USDGC, Throw Pink, and the DGBT Championship on their coverage. Paul and Hannah Macbeth are anticipating their baby, I believe, today, if not already. And if rumors are true, we, are, we can anticipate a baby Pablo. And guys, that wraps up another twig. If you haven't already, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share. And if you want more, make sure to peek previous episodes.